to The Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, licensed fishing guide and chief executive fish nerd of The Fish Nerds Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. If you've been listening for a long time, I'm super happy you're still with us. If you're new, uh, welcome. We're super happy to have you. We love new people, and uh, we hope that you tell your friends about us, and uh, you keep on keeping on listening and subscribing tonight on the show, or today on the show. This is going to be great. We have the guys from Really Hooked Fish Company who just closed a deal on Shark Tank. Uh, they got $75,000 from Mark Cuban. Um, I actually was able to call them and chat with them on the phone. They were in their minivan, uh, so it's an interesting phone call, to say the least. Uh, but we're excited about that. This is be our, I think, our fifth Shark Tank winner on the show. We are, we are Shark Tank full these days. Uh, Doc Martin is back. Uh, the good doctor is in with some fake fish in the news. We're going to learn about telling fake news from real news on uh, Fish in the News. Rich Collins, our fly fishing correspondent, is here. He's going to tell us why fishing in November sucks. Uh, I'm very curious about this. Uh, and, of course, we have the real news as well. So uh, buckle up, kids. We're in for a ride tonight. This episode is sponsored by the Fish Nerds Guide Service. If you are in New Hampshire or New England or you want to fly here uh, and you want to go uh, ice fishing and have a fun day on the ice with me, uh, Clay Groves, the, uh, the only guide at Fish Nerds Guide Service, uh, come on out. We'll have a great day. Um, go to fishnerds.com for details. Uh, we'll, we'll do a custom trip for you. We can go for lake trout, bass, panfish, white perch, whatever you like. And I can fish at a lot of different lakes. We can go anywhere from Winnipesaukee to the worst lake in New Hampshire, Silver Lake. And I'd be happy to take you fishing. And I guarantee you, you'll have fun and you'll get a hot meal. Can't promise you a ton of fish, Ollie's, but <laughs> we'll have a lot of fun. Anyway, that's fishnerds.com for more details. Now on with the show. First up, my interview with Really Hooked Fish Company. Okay, fish nerds, welcome back. Uh, it's your lucky night. I, I'm getting the opportunity here to talk with um, the guys from Real, Really Hooked Fish Company who just won $75,000 deal from Mark Cuban on the Shark Tank. So I want to welcome to the show James Acaro and Steve Markley. You guys, thanks, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thank you for having us. We're excited to be here or talking to you, and uh, we're, we're, we're anxious to see <laughs> what's going to happen. Oh, so am I. Uh, before, we, before we get too much yeah, into the interview, because I have some really good questions for you, uh, for listeners who didn't watch Shark Tank, and I imagine most people watch Shark Tank, could you guys give us a quick pitch on what your, what your product is? What are we talking about here? Uh, well, we make a healthy smoked fish dip. Uh, Steve and I, we, we kind of, uh, Steve kind of came up with the idea and, you know, we're both avid fishermen. We fished King Mackerel off the Atlantic here down in the Southeast, uh, off the Southeast coast of Florida. And, you know, we, we decided to try to do a smoked fish dip, pretty popular item here in Florida, but we wanted to do something different, something unique, something that didn't have, you know, the cream cheese or mayo dominated dip. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, decided to use Greek yogurt, and it, the taste test and everything went, went well. Steve had had recipes in the past, and, and we put it together, and it, it just, it just uh, it, the response was, like, overwhelmingly good. Good. And, that, and speaking just now, that was, was that James? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you, James. And on, on the Shark Tank show, you guys do this whole big song and dance number, which if you haven't seen already, you should go back and watch the Shark Tank episode. Uh, because I think that you sold that dip before you even pitched, like just with that in introduction dance you guys did. Uh, and, and I'm not going to give it all away, but it's totally worth people going on YouTube or wherever and finding that video and watching it. But hey, congratulations on, on the Shark Tank thing. That was recorded back in June, right? That's correct. Yes. June yeah. and we were patiently waiting and holding this internal secret for a very long time. Yeah, now that's imp it's an, it's a really hard secret. I've had a lot of other Shark Tank folks on the podcast, and they all talk about that difference in time and how much happens between when they first get on the Shark Tank and then when it airs. And for you guys, actually, you've had some tragedy between the airing of the Shark Tank episode and and now. Um, uh, James, you lost your home to a hurricane. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, me and my fiance lived in Big Pine Key, 
you know, we were down there and, you know, this was coming back uh, from, you know, after our pitch and, and, and Hurricane uh, Irma took a turn for the worse and we got evacuated. We weren't allowed to come back for 14 days. By the time we came back, uh, we just pretty much lost everything and everything inside the home. So we actually are still like we bounced around quite a bit. I think it was September 7th. We're finally looking to get into a home looks like November 20th. So it's been a lot going on. It's been a rocky road, uh, a lot of trials and tribulations, but you know, things are, things are definitely looking up. Yeah. And if you're going to be homeless, Florida is a good place to be. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's warm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean here, I live in New Hampshire and right in right now it's 17 degrees out and snowing. So it'd be, it wouldn't be as fun. Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> so, but hey, congratulations. Um, I, I do want to get into the, into the Shark Tank stuff, but I want to go back before Shark Tank a little bit uh, because I'm always curious. I'm always impressed people who are making a living in the fishing industry or trying to because it's such a difficult industry. Uh, how, how hard was it to get on Shark Tank for you guys? It was a challenge. The process is rigorous. You, you were kind of mentioning that you talked to the other Shark Tank guests mm-hmm. or that, that were able to pitch on there. And I was thinking about support, starting like a support group that we could all get together because it's, it's difficult. And, and it started for us. There's, di- there's different ways that they actually get entrepreneurs on there. And the way we got on there was, was just an email that we sent through like their website on ABC. We just sent a simple email with a photo at us, like at a farmer's market. No and kidding. we didn't hear anything. Yeah, we, we didn't hear anything for months. And we had actually forgotten about it. And the, actually one of the worst days we had in our business, you know, you have these ups and downs. One of the biggest downs we had was, was when we figured out that we weren't, we weren't able to write our HACCP plan internally and all this, all this crazy department of agriculture stuff came down on us and being a small business that those are difficult challenges. And uh, just laying on the couch with my wife and I was like, what are we going to do? You know? And she's like, what about shark tank? And I said, you know, that's just a thing. We sent an email. Like that's just a thing. That was months ago. No joke. 15 minutes later was the first phone call, man. No kidding. <laughs> That's yeah. perfect. And then you have to go through this whole preliminary process of, of, of getting through producers before you get on the show, right? There's all this kind of you do. prep work. It's, yes, lots of prep work. It's, it's multi-layered, uh, lots of video submissions, and nothing's ever for sure. For sure. Like every, every time you pass something and get to the next level, it's always like prefaced, prefaced with the fact that, oh, you might not make it or you might not go or this might not happen. So you're, you're always, you, you, you basically have butterflies in your stomach for months trying to go through this process. Yeah, it sounds terrible, but great at the same time. I was talking to Vance Zahorsky from the Line Cutters Company about his, sure, yeah. his, his process. Uh, and he said, even after they recorded the show, they said, you, we still might not use the segment when it airs you know, in six months. He's or dead. Yeah, he's, he's spot on. So they, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, you made it. Congratulations. Welcome to LA. But <laughs> hey, we, we cast too many, we cast too many people. So you might not air. So, you know, it, so let me ask you this. So if, if they cast you and they go through the recording process and the sharks make a deal with you, it doesn't air. Does the deal go away if it doesn't air or does the deal still stay good? No, not necessarily. The deal in the air in the actual air and gate or whether it airs don't necessarily go hand in hand. Okay. I was just curious. It, it's two separate things from what we understand. Well, you, you did it anyway successfully. And, you know, it's really cool too. Whenever they, the last pitch of the night is always, I think, the best pitch. It's the pitch that people stick around for. And so the fact that they put you last, that's a huge compliment to you guys and to your products and well, to your pitching style. We actually weren't last. So what they did was is they ran a double episode and we were actually first on the second episode. So it may, it oh. may have appeared like, <laughs> yeah. So Right before bedtime for me. <laughs> no, it's all good yeah so we we tried to like analyze why they do certain things and mm-hmm. it's we we're pretty much killing ourselves because it's impossible man we have no idea how any of this or why any of this happens at how it does in fact we were told we were going to get a little more notice than what we got we ended up getting tacked on to a double episode 13 days notice is what we got well, who cares? You did it. <laughs> so congratulations. That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. 
It's, it's really cool. Now, before I have some questions for you from listeners and fans of Shark Tank. I put out, we have a private Facebook group for the Fish Nerds podcast, a lot of really engaged uh, audience there. And uh, one of our listeners, Michael Crooker is his name. He's from New Hampshire. He's been fishing with me a few times. His question is, uh, he wants to know why you didn't follow the proper procedures and talk to the fish nerds before Shark Tank. How did you get, well, how on earth would you go to Shark Tank before coming on the fish nerds is the question. How dare you? Yeah, because, I, you know, honestly, I already had to share half the glory with Steve and then Steve <laughs> had to share half the glory with me. So we were like, it was, we just, it's greed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, were, we always pride ourselves on being the stepping stone to Shark Tank because so many p- businesses come through the fish nerds and then end up on Shark Tank afterwards. So we were just <laughs> giving you a hard time there. Um, but it, it's cool that you're spending time with us tonight anyway. All right. Uh, so let's get into some questions about your fish. You guys are using uh, king mackerels, which are a really oily fish. And in New Hampshire, we have regular, I don't know if they're common mackerel or what they're called, but they're just little, you know, greasy mackerels. They're good. Are king mackerel sustainably caught? And then what, what do you do with the other parts of the fish that aren't used in the smoking process? The fish are sustainably caught from regulated waters. You know, we make sure of that. So we're good there. Good. Uh, it's very important to us. Steve and, you know, Steve and I, when we first set out, you know, that was, you know, the ocean is our home. Uh, we always want to use sustainable fisheries, you know, preferably, you know, the local waters and, and making sure that we're not, you know, t- you know taking from the ocean that gives back so much to us. You know, we, we live, breathe, and sleep the, the ocean. So, you know, it's, it's a great question, and, and it's very important to us. As far as the rest of the fish, the heads a lot of times are sold for, uh, you know, the crabbers use them in crab traps. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rest of the carcasses, a lot of those are discarded back into the ocean. Yeah, they're mackerel. Yep. They'll, they'll get eaten by something for sure. Um, all right, so Rich Collins and Ryan Dubé, two of our listeners, both had the same question. What type of wood do you like to smoke over, and why did you choose that kind of wood? We went through a bunch of different woods. We, we were using some local citrusy woods. We found that because we do add apples into our recipe, that the apple wood was, it complemented it well. It's, it's not a real heavy smoke. It gives it more of a mild flavor, and it, it just kind of adds to that sweet that sweet taste you get on the on the front end of our fish dip. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so Brian McGilver, one of our other listeners from I think it's from Ohio or Idaho or somewhere, uh, he wants to know why do you use mackerel and do you plan on on diversifying your fishes? Yeah, well we we we've used several different types of fish. Uh, we've smoked mahi. We've even smoked tuna. We smoked king mackerel. We smoked amberjack. King mackerel just complemented our dip the best. Amberjack is a very close second. Not that we wouldn't implement amberjack in the future, but, you know, we were able to get a, a, a pretty good supply of, of king mackerel, and it just worked really well with our recipe and our ingredients. So you guys have a good time with this, right? This is fun? Yeah, and, absolutely. And and so since being on Shark Tank, you guys, have, has your phone been, like, ringing off the hook like crazy? Have you become very popular? Yeah, in fact, you know, just getting coordinating th- this with you, this was this was kind of luck uh, <laughs> as far as getting me and him together because we're running two different parts of the operation, and the between the Facebook, the Instagram, the website, the phone calls, it's absolutely it's 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 overwhelming, and it, but it's it's a positive thing, but it, it it doesn't mean that it's not overwhelming. There's a lot of responses and. A, a lot of people are reaching out to us right now. So it's an amazing feeling, but it, uh, we're trying to organize it the best we can right now. So you guys um, on Shark Tank, you said what you might want to use some money for is to take this on as a full-time uh, gig. Has that happened? I've had to move into the uh, company full-time. Uh, so yeah, this is James. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm currently working the business full-time. Steve is still currently a uh, full-time wild and firefighter on top of trying to balance everything he's doing uh, in the marketing as well, anywhere he's needed really, but a lot in the marketing aspect and in the website and, and, and so on. Uh, I think it's funny because I think people have this understanding that, you know, you, you go on Shark Tank and you get a deal and everything is like just amazing. There's so much work involved. There's still a lot of work involved. And honestly, neither one of us has collected a a paycheck yet the difficulties are still there even after you like air and land the show and, and there's still things that that have to be put in place and worked out uh it, it's just not all the the glam or glitz and stuff like that it's a lot of work 
Yeah. And that's, and that's what I hear from all the entrepreneurs I talk to is it's, it just starts at Shark Tank, but then the work comes and you have to actually get in there and grind out the work and do the stuff. Uh, but still, it's, it's fun to have that support. And so you got $75,000 from Mark Cuban. When you walked into Shark Tank, did you know you wanted Mark Cuban or did, were you going to take whatever came your way? I think that our options were definitely open. So I, I personally started researching the Sharks individually and then, and then James and I together eventually. And honestly, because Damon's like a fisherman and he does a lot outdoors and mm-hmm. uh, it, it seemed like and he, and he had um, he had the three jerks beef jerky and he had he had the, the other um, the Bubba barbecue or the bone. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, and like, and he and he used to be in the seafood industry some way somehow. He said he did some sort of commercial fishing or something. Um, so we sort of set our eyes on him, and then I think that we just we didn't believe that Mark would actually buy into us in a way. But we were open minded to anybody uh, as long as the deal was somewhat decent. So we were kind of blown away and very excited at the fact that we ended up landing Mark. Yeah, my my favorite part was uh, Mr. Wonderful says you're gonna throw a mackerel in a blender and call it three hundred thousand dollars. I'm out. And <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> hey, that, that's my favorite part too, man. Yeah. And and then and then Mark went, oh, I'll do that. And he gave you exactly what you were asking for, which is which I find remarkable because you because I know that everyone goes in there with a number that's different than what they present. And the fact that Mark mm-hmm. just paid you what you asked for is it's amazing. That doesn't happen very often. And whatever you did, you did it just right for him. Hit that sweet spot for Mark. Um, and, and also his best quote was, the best way to close a deal sometimes is to shut up. Yep. Well, I have been uh, guilty of that many times. So I'll, t- I'll tell you what, what you guys see is so different sometimes than, than what actually happens in sure. there too. And some of the edit and things, um, you know, we were in there like an hour and it gets edited down to, you know, like 11 minutes. So mm-hmm. some of the stuff that you, that you actually see or the conversations are cut and chopped and it's all unscripted and it's all, it all comes at you one take straight up. The viewers see it in, in somewhat of a different way than the guys that are present there at the time. Well, it was cool for me, just as a viewer, to see how much all the sharks seem to like you guys as people. And and it kind of helps us as, as watchers kind of get drawn into your story and look at who you guys are. And I noticed on your website, and you mentioned it on the show, that a percentage of, of your sales goes to help with firefighters and wildfires. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. So when we started this, company uh we were both working together at the same station and we're wildland firefighters so we're you know we're, we we fight fires out in the woods we deploy out west to the big western fires right the most um, badass of all firefighters really i mean that's the that's how we feel toughest. yeah, yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> so we were doing that and when we started putting this thing together we said we wanted to be able to give back to something that was that was sort of greater than us and we we researched a lot of the the different foundations out there and the wildland firefighter foundation was sort of the go-to for fallen firefighters or even even injured badly we decided that you know we were going to contribute a portion which right now it's five percent of profit that we're going to relay or send to the wildland firefighter foundation that's what we wanted to do we wanted to give back i think it's fantastic and and you know socially conscious uh, companies are really important to me. Uh, the fact that you guys are doing sustainable fishing and being socially conscious, exciting. I need to try your dip. I haven't tried it yet. So you need to send me some so I can give a taste and report back. We can do that. We'll maybe need to do like uh, a review while, while we're on the phone. So that way you can't say anything too bad. Maybe you'll... I'll be politer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll be, way, you'll be politer. I don't yeah. know though pretty far away too yeah it's pretty <laughs> far away uh and so right now you guys are selling your your dip it's it's in some um some brew pubs is it available for distribution can like a person go on your website and order it or how do people get your dip so those are the some of the challenges we're working through we knew we weren't ready to ship directly to the consumer door right mm-hmm. when we aired and we just we were just not prepared for that as a company but we're working to get to that and i think we're close so Hopefully, we can have a, a shipping solution nationally very soon. Other than that, we're in six total locations in Florida. Five are in, on the uh, the West Coast in the Tampa Bay area. And the one is our headquarters out of Key Largo right now where um, you can get the fish dip. And okay. we're going to be adding to that very soon and, and probably ramping that up fairly quickly, uh, especially with all the folks that have been reaching out to us through email and, and wanting to get it in their, their stores. So we're just... 
we're figuring out solutions as we go and, and we're working through the problems. And I, I think that we're going to be able to take this thing where we want it to uh, in a fairly short period of time. Fabulous. And you have a, you have a, you have a, a dream problem. You have people asking, how can I buy your stuff? So that's like, everyone wants that problem. That's a good, good, good place to be. Yep. It's all about, it's just a, it's just a matter of, you know, converting that and being able to supply to that. And you're right. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. Now my parents are in Tampa Bay right now. So where can I send them? You can send them to any of the Brown boxers on Clearwater beach. Mm -hmm. Um, They have one on Madeira beach as well. So the three Brown boxer locations and Bumpus fish shack, which is in Tarpon Springs and Clearwater beach as well. All right, I'm set, I'm setting them on a mission next week to to go and find this, and they'll get, they'll report back to me. Let me know what they think. Um, it, it's really cool. For, this is really exciting stuff. So, what's your next big move? What's happening next for you guys? We're just kind of taking it one step at a time. Our direct vision right now is to make sure that we can accommodate the consumers that are reaching out to us. They're being patient. They've just been awesome with their words, with their encouragement. So right now, our clear you know, vision is to make sure that we can reach and get the, the product to those consumers. Hopefully in the future, you know, we can reach out to more restaurants. And, and we do see a bigger vision, hopefully, like with like Whole Foods or Sprouts, you know, uh, across the nation and being able to provide a, a fresh product to them with zero preservatives that they can get. And, and eat fresh. Well, it's it's exciting stuff. I'm super excited for you to see what happens next. People can go to your website, which is reallyhooked.com. It's R-E-E-L-Y, hooked, H-O-O-K-E-D.com, and check out your product. Talking to real assassin James Arcaro and Captain Hooked, <laughs> Steve Markley. That's you guys' uh, name for the show. And any parting words, anything, last thoughts that you should let people want to know about you guys or about being a fish entrepreneur, what do, you, what do you want people to take away from this? This is James. I'll tell you what, I'm 40 years old and I've had, you know, businesses in the past. I think what people can take away from this is, you know, hard work and perseverance. And in the American dream, it's still alive. It exists. Mm-hmm. It's there for the taking. It's going to require for you to get, get your hands dirty and, and, and get out there. And you're going to go through, you're going to go through times and you're going to go through moments where you're almost about to quit. But if you can muster up just a little bit more and you can persevere, I promise you that whatever you set out to do, you can accomplish. I mean, we're prime examples of that. We're still in the trenches. We're still digging, but it's happening for us. We're getting a lot of love, a lot of support, and it's just an amazing ride, an amazing journey. We've grown so much through this experience. So it exists. The American dream, it's real. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, guys, for coming on the podcast. And when this is available for national distribution, um, I'll make sure that we share that out with the Fish Nerds um, social media so people can get a taste of your dip. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Clay, for having us, man. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. been great. All right. You're welcome. Wow. Those guys are great. I can't wait to taste their dip. Uh, And this winter, I'm actually going to catch a lake trout, smoke it, uh, and and try one of their dip recipes, see if I can't uh, steal some of their ideas. And maybe we'll have really nerdy fish company. I don't know. But we'll give it a shot. Uh, Hey, uh, this week, we hit a milestone with the Fish Nerds podcast group on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, do a little search for the Fish Nerds podcast group. We hit the magical satanic number of 666, the sign of the devil, this week. So we decided to do a devil's giveaway. So the the devil devil's giveaway is a who rag uh, and some decals. Decals made for us by our friends over at Backwoods Graphics. Uh, and I posted the contest on Friday. I said, enter by midnight. I threw all the entries in the hat and I drew one out. And the winner is Marvin Michael. Marvin, drop me an email at clay at fishnerds.com. Dot com and with your address, and I will mail you your who rag. I fully expect to see photos of your who rag and your decals, and of course, some fish. Thank you guys for playing again. That's ever at um, the Fish Nerds podcast group. If you're not in that group, you're missing a lot of the fun. Okay, how about some fake fish in the news with Doc Martin? Hi, everybody. This is Doc Martin here today with a very special guest and friend of mine. We thought we would do a little game show type thing. So the guest that I have is John, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Yeah, this is uh, John Beemore. And basically what I do is I work for the Department of Defense. I'm in charge of the uh, Protective Intelligence Branch, Chief of Watch Operations. 
And part of my job, what I actually do, is I basically track down fake news and other issues, and I try to correct those issues uh, which are on social media. All right, so given what John does for a living, he deals with fake news as part of the government for the Department of Defense. So the Fish Nerd Nation thought it would be fun to see if John could pick out some fishy fake news. So what we're going to do is Clay, our FN librarian Jeff, and then myself, Doc Martin, are each going to read John a story, and he has to pick the one that is true. So there are three different stories, and only one of them is a true story. So we are going to start with Jeff's story. Hey, it's Jeff, the effing librarian in the middle of the effing country. I'm here to read you a story, a news story from theriverbender.com, which is a website detailing the goings-on in the Alton, Illinois area. Headline... Alton resident catches 736 pound catfish in Mississippi River by Brittany Kohler, content manager. So what we have here is a story, actually an intergenerational saga of one family versus a really big catfish. And it's a long story. I'll summarize it. Red Mudger of Meadowbrook first told the story of the day he discovered the biggest catfish ever known to man back in 1902 goes on to detail his hooking but not landing of a very large catfish. Then we come on to the present day where we have Cato Mudcat Mudger of Alton, Illinois, uh, who set out for the whole month of March to catch the monster catfish discovered by his great-grandpa Red. And he did catch it. And after an epic struggle, he got the fish in, and it was a 736-pound catfish. Experts say the fish, a Mekong giant catfish, was around 170 years old and never seen in this part of the world. Furthermore, the catfish broke the world record for heaviest fish and the oldest fish ever caught. Real news? Fake news? We'll let Duck Martin figure that one out. This is Jeff, the effing librarian, out. So, a 738-pound fish. I don't know if that would be false or true. But um, I don't know. It's, it doesn't seem very believable to me right off the bat. Um, so let me hear the other two stories and let me determine. All right. So we just heard Jeff's story about a giant catfish. And next we are going to hear a story from Clay about parrotfish. Parrotfish poop makes beautiful beaches. Uh, You're going to love this one. Uh, The Maldives form a constellation of almost 1,200 coral reef islands in the Indian Ocean. They have stunning white sand beaches surrounded by emerald blue water. And according to a new study, they may owe their existence to parrotfish. More specifically, to parrotfish poop. If you've ever snorkeled near a coral reef, you've probably seen neon-colored parrotfish. Their name refers to their sharp beak-like teeth. You may have heard them, too. That's parrotfish literally eating the reef's coral skeleton. It bites off tiny pieces of hard coral as it forages for algae. That gets taken into the fish. It's then milled. Milled means digested. And it passes through their intestines and then is excreted out the back end. That's French for butt. <laughs> as clouds of sediment. Um, this is from Chris Perry, a marine geoscientist. Uh, and then it's distributed into the reef. And it's uh, a way that you can convert a coral substrate into sediment-grade material. So, that reef that keeps growing and growing and growing, um, that's all parrotfish poop. Um, And then it turns into sandy beaches. And that is the news. Okay, so based upon the two I've heard so far, the one, the first one just sounds more like a story, while the second one sounds more like an explanation for something that's actually happening out in the Maldives. So my inclination right now is for basically number two. But let me go ahead and heal the fish stock story and make a final determination after that. 
Okay, so the final story that I have, this is a study about catfish. So two of the three stories are about catfish. So this is from a recent study done at the University of North Carolina. And what they did is they performed a genetic analysis of 8,000 DNA samples from a variety of different kinds of fish, mostly different catfishes, bullheads, uh, and all those different kinds. And they found that the origin specifically of the black bullhead, that is Amiurus metallus, is from the common family. Uh, Sorry about that. My uh, dog and cat decided to greet each other. (laughs) But anyway, so... Uh, so what they found was that basically the bullhead Amiaris um, mellus, the black bullhead, is not in the catfish family. So it is actually more closely related to the sculpin. So that is out of the University of North Carolina after a genetic analysis of these different kinds of catfish species. So, all right, John, those are your three stories. Right off the bat, I just don't think it's actually... The first story I heard about the 738 or 736-pound catfish. So it's either between story two or three between the fish poop for the Maldives or the actual study. You know, thinking about it and just just thinking about, you know, the actual construct of, you know, what you're talking about. uh, One is basically descriptive, which are more leaning towards story number two. And while the third one is just a study which can be obviously, you know, fake news, and it can just be linked to just certain sources. Um, so I think my inclination is that I'm going to go with actually number two. So am I right in that regard? All right, so we're going with number two for number two. <laughs> there you go. There's your fish nerds poop joke for the day. Now, before I give you what the right answer is, John, would you let the fish nerds know what your experience is with fishes and do you have a lot of prior experience? Are you secretly hiding anything, secret fish knowledge from us that might bias your opinion? So the only experience I have with fish is I had a goldfish when I was a young kid, when I was seven. That's about my experience with fishes. So if you come up to me with a scientific name for fishes or you tell me a bunch of stories, I'm just going to be like, yes, okay, I, I believe you. I would definitely want to believe you, especially Doc Martin over here, but I think she's trying to trick me, you know, with her story, but I guess we'll find out. All right, fans. Do you have your opinions, too? Make sure you do. Do you think John is right? Make sure you scream it at your radios. (laughs) He is correct. So the one true story was the parrotfish poop story. Um, And I bet that we will provide a link to all three stories so you fans can go onto our Fish Nerds website and check out that information at your leisure. Very good. I'm actually very impressed because some of those are really, really tricky. Um, I know the catfish one comes from one of our big fans and we have friendly banter about what is a catfish and what isn't, which is always really fun. So a little bit of sarcasm, which is always appreciated. Thank you so much, John, for being on our show. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to do this. With that, John and I will sign off and we will catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks, Doc. Glad you're part of this show. Always a joy. Uh, Okay. And we have uh, Rich Collins. Rich Collins is our fishing uh, fly fishing correspondent he's with us and he hates fishing in november and he pushed record and went on a little tirade and here is rich you can find rich's work at thirstproductions.com hello nerds this is your fly fishing correspondent rich collins checking in here in uh november my least favorite season to uh exist basically because fishing kind of sucks the weather kind of sucks. It's not all that pretty out, and, uh, you know, so I get a little squirrely. So I said, why not record a podcast and talk a little bit about my uh, top five flies of the year. The top flies that I found most effective were as follows. Um, one is the Chernobyl ant, which is a giant foam-bodied ant with rubber legs. It looks like a water spider. It's about the size of a quarter. Um, For me, tan and black, they come in all colors, red, yellow, um, shinier colors like purple. But for me, good old tan and black Chernobyl ants up in my neck of the woods work great. uh, The fish think it's a 
I don't know if they think it's a spider or a fly or what, grasshopper, um, but it could be an ant too. But they just see legs, they see body, they see meat, and it's a meat, um, you know, it's an inspiring to uh, eat pattern. It really gets them out of the weeds and uh, they nail it. I love that. So that fly has been always a favorite. The second one I have is called a Duracell. It has different names, but basically it's a nymph with a jig hook, meaning the hook is inverted, So, um, and it's got a tungsten bead head, so it darts around on the bottom or close to the bottom. Um, so it's a jig hook nymph. I don't necessarily run it like a traditional nymph, meaning under a bobber, or sorry, fishermen, fly fishermen call them strike indicators. Um, instead, I use it more on uh, the end of a floating line and just give it little taps and whips, and that has been killer. It's got, it's purple. It's got UV dubbing in it, so it's purplish. Um, I don't know what UV really looks like to fish underwater, but they seem to like that. Um, the next fly is the Sculpin Snack. It's made by Orvis. I haven't found it anywhere else. Um, it's unique to them. It only comes in one size, which is uh, nice, but it is uh, golden has legs. I just need to see if there's almost a theme here. Um, very shiny, very pretty, conehead bugger, um, and there's something about the UV, the legs, and the action in that fly, particular fly, that's just been killer. Um, I think fish think it's a golden stone fly hatching, or they just see it again as meat. I, I'm going to keep hearing the same thing. I, I tend to throw meat flies in my fishing, which could make me Somewhere between a bait fisherman and a true fly fisherman that only believes that, you know, surface tide um, perfectly presented mayflies or caddis in season um, at a hatch is really fly fishing, but I don't buy that at all. I think it's the rod and reel and the type of line and the way you cast it that conducts fly fishing, but, you know, we're here to, we're here to debate. And um, the next fly that I just absolutely love is the caddis, the elk hair caddis. It's so versatile. Here in New England, there's always caddis floating around. They skitter on top of the water. The elk hair caddis has just been a mainstay fly for so long. It's just so versatile. It's so easy to use. Um, there's one thing that I use with my elk hair caddises that has really changed the game, and that's uh, this product called Frog Spanny. You can look it up. What it is is it's a type of silica, I believe. Um, it's a powder. It comes with a little brush. You powder on um, this almost white powdery. Um, it's very, it's hard to explain. It's very drying. If you get it on your fingers, it dries your fingers out. It'll crack your fingers out. But what it does is it repels water. So you put it on all the fibers of these um, elk hair caddis. Um, you douse it up really good, you get it in all the nooks and craddies, and the flies float on top of the water, way on top of the water. And you, you'll, you can notice the difference. If, if the fly isn't way up on the water, um, barely in the surface, the fish won't take it. But you, you douse on some frogs fanny, and it's like a different world. And it only lasts, you know, maybe 20 or 30 casts. you got to give it another dose. But it's really fascinating stuff. Um, and you can then also strip an elk hair caddis real fast with your line and it'll dart below the water. And there's something about this frog's fanny that's supposed to produce a type of small bubble underwater that more represents a um, nymph emerging. I'm getting a little high, a little highbrow here, but I don't know if that's true or not. I just know if you want to use caddis or any dry fly, this works well. And get some frog spanny. It's six bucks a jar. Um, I also ordered off eBay a big tub of it for like ten bucks, and it's not as good. It works okay, but it doesn't last as long. I don't think it's as fine a grain. So the original is the way to go, even though it costs more when you really need it. So when you get to you know when you're fishing somewhere, you know there aren't big fish, you can use the bulk stuff, but uh, definitely invest in some of the others. So elk hair caddis, always a favorite. I can't speak well enough about it. Um, and the final fly that I tend to use and love in a door is similar to the sculpin snack because it's an Orvis fly. I've only really found them at Orvis, though I'm sure they exist elsewhere similarly. They call this the tungsten jig bugger. Um, and their little tagline is bounce this tungsten streamer jig along the bottom and hold on. And, but it's really true. Um, it's heavy and it's weighted up front. 
It's like a small, thin woolly bugger, but it's got two rubber legs um, sticking out the side. And when you kind of jig this little guy, it doesn't so much to me look like a minnow. It looks more like an emerging insect with wings coming out, those two little rubber legs, and you'd really need to see a picture of it. Um, they've referred to it as a mini streamer tied on a jig hook, um, and it's from a European ascent, so interesting. Um, but that little guy has done all kinds of things, um, especially on a fast strip after a pause. You know, strip, strip, pause, pause, strip, pause. Um, so it's done more for me than a traditional woolly bugger, I think, because it's weighted more. And it uh, dives down faster, and that's just been a great fly. Um, and it must be great for Orvis, because every time I order them, they're back ordered for four or six months. So they're hard to get... Um, fascinating little fly but yeah you'll see uh that most of my good flies with the exception of the caddis are some kind of um fast action jig type fly and i was thinking about that as we were talking about you know why old streamers work for some and newfangled things work for others but for me it's just the type of fishing that i do i get really bored with um bobber and nymph fishing where you just do, you know you hang a nymph three feet off a bobber and let it float in the same water column 300 times and the fish pick it up um, very casually. Sometimes they nail it, but it's a very uh, calculated and it's a very repetitive type of fly fishing. It's just not my thing. I like to go um, hunt and I like to kind of chase and I like the take and I like the all the all the pieces involved. So I tend to use a more aggressive, almost like a spin fishing kind of um, thing with my fly rod. So I'll, I'll admit it out loud. I'm, I'm not a traditional true fly guy. Um, I have all the mayflies. I have all the stuff that they talk about, the spinners, and, and I just don't use them enough. They're very specific to a certain time of day, and uh, quite frankly, these, these flies work year-round in almost all conditions, some better than others, some places better than others, at least in New England, but um, talking to a fellow at the shop that said that those Duracells were killing out west, so I don't know, there's something to it. So those are my top flies for the, uh, for the year. They change a little year to year. Um, especially as, you know, as you get your fly box full of them and then someone gives you something and you start focusing on that fly. So the fly that tends to work best is the one you use the most. So hopefully um, I'll get some new ones and kind of rotate through. Curious what your favorite flies are? Curious what your favorite fishing patterns are? Um, you know, go to the Facebook pages and uh, get involved and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll bust your chops. So that's it for today. That's it for my November. Hope I didn't drive you crazy with my boredom cabin fever, um, but I'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Okay, so this show, uh, Fish Nerds, is sponsored by really, truly our listeners. Our listeners support our show by going to a website called patreon.com. Patreon is a crowdfunding website. If you like this show and you think it's worth maybe a buck, for, for entertainment we're hoping that listeners will donate a dollar per episode go to patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n slash fish nerds uh, and sign up and it's automatic it's like four bucks a month and you be our best friend if you give us two dollars we'll mail you a hoorag you give us five bucks you get a hat if you give us 25 dollars we'll mention your business and right now we got one patreon giving at the 25 dollar level that is uh my friend josh lopes you can find uh his website at lopestax.com. If you're in Massachusetts and you want a tax guy, Josh is your guy. He's a fish nerd and he sponsors our show. So uh, lopestax.com. And again, of course, go to patreon.com slash fish nerds and help us fund this program. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. All right, time for some real fish in the news and our friend david jakubiak from elpc.org is back to help us talk about gar fish gar okay clay grubbs here with the fish nerds uh and we're doing the news i'm here with david jakubiak from the environmental law and policy <laughs> law and po from the environmental <laughs> law and policy center oh my god my mouth is just full of words today and i can't seem to get them all out as i need it and David's here because we got some news across our desk about two stories about the GAR. The first one David wants to talk about is the GAR resolution. So I'm not even going to introduce this one, David. I'm going to let you just talk about the GAR resolution. Well, what's really exciting about this one is that it shows what is possible when anglers reach out to 
the environmental community and the conservation community to try to get something done. And the background on this story is, is this. Several years ago now, our mutual friend Olaf Nelson caught an alligator dog in Illinois, first one since the 60s. And that fish was part of a restocking program that went on for a couple of years. And then by the mid 2000s, it was stopped. Um, or the late 2000s. Were they, were they, were they, did they stop it because the gar weren't, weren't catching on or was it too expensive or was no one didn't care? I think there were a number of issues. If you talk to DNR, they were worried about uh, the mortality rates they're seeing in the fish. Um, there was also not a huge outcry um, to keep the program going. So typically, if there's a lot of public support for a program, uh, agency find a way to keep the program going. When it begins to slip underneath or out of the sunlight, it, it tends to go away. And so Olaf and I hooked up with uh, Solomon David, who at the time was at the Shedd Aquarium. Uh, anybody who knows Gar knows Solomon. I know and, him from Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. That's yeah, the only way so I know him. Yeah. We were just talking about the importance of Gar as, as a species in the system. And there were a number of themes that came up. One is gar, historically have always been in Illinois. Alligator gar have always been in the southern part of the state. They're an apex predator. Uh, they perform a really important function as that top line predator in terms of ensuring the health of species. And then a, a little thing that, that caused a little bit of trouble, and I can talk to that a little bit later if you're interested, was I was talking to a, a guy with Missouri's DNR. He told me that Gar can eat Asian carp. Well, so we put together a resolution and we highlighted a number of um, facts about Gar. The Gar uh, have always been here since the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, they're an apex predator. They're an underrated food fish. Uh, they are an underrated sport fish. Um, the program to bring them back will. Uh, open up potentially a new resource for the DNR if these bark can get big, folks will be willing to pay money to go out and get one. Um, and we talked to some local state representatives about GAR and the importance of GAR, and they decided to take it up as their own. They introduced the resolution, and it ended up passing unanimously through both houses of the Illinois General Assembly. And Within a couple months of the resolution passing, the IDNR announced that they were bringing back the alligator gar program full bore. Um, and they were also going to expand their look at all ancient fishes. So not only alligator gar, but the spotted gar, the long nosed gar, the short nosed gar, and both in, see how their populations are doing in Illinois and, and look at whether or not we need regulations Help so the, the resolution was to restart restocking GAR again? The resolution was to create a uh, public sign of support for the alligator GAR stocking program. And it directly called on DNR to uh, get that program going and look at whether or not we need regulations in the state to help preserve uh, and advance the, the population of the species. Okay, cool. And so the, the resolution passed. Yep. And everyone's like, yeah, we love the garfish. Cool. Mostly. 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 Well, well, I, yeah. well t hey, t tell me about the <laughs> anti gar people. I want to hear about those people. Yeah, so what happened was DNR um, did their first release of gar uh, in the fall. Mm -hmm. And they had a group of marina owners in the southern part of the state who came in and said that they were never going to put their boats in the water again because of alligator gar. Because they thought the gar would hurt them, or if they caught them, they would stink their boats up? Yeah, no, they uh, they were convinced that alligator gar were the freshwater river version of jaws, ah. and that they were going to be picking off children and women and damaging props and doing all kinds of things that we've always read people said about gar in the 1800s yeah, so, people in the 1800s and jeremy wade uh, <laughs> no, but, yeah. you got anyone who's wrecking really cool fish it's jeremy wade <laughs> so. so the great news was dnr spent some time um going out to these communities and 
showing them how the, the jaws of these fish work and that they're definitely not going to take out women or children or boats, uh, especially not in the waters that we have that are chock full of delicious kids of chat. Right. And they are delicious. <laughs> so I, I love it. I, I love the people who are just are afraid of nature. You know, they're just, they can't understand balance. They can't understand that nature doesn't care about them. That Like their ego is so big that they think everything in the wild's out to get them when mostly nothing cares about them. So it's fantastic. But what's great is we had, um, we had some real support, not only from hook and line anglers, but from the bow fishing community. Um, and so we had a good constituency of folks that were out there with us advocates and scientists who were talking to people about about these fish and it's that that full lineup of folks who are out there to advocate for these fish that mm -hmm. makes frankly makes change possible possible yeah yeah uh, well it's funny i was doing a little bit of research on this and i kept coming across bow fishing articles bow fishing is hunting fish with a bow and arrow and I found this interesting article about piles of garfish piled up on riverbanks dead uh, because of bow hunters. Uh, what, what is your personal, this doesn't have to be your, your business side, but your personal opinion on people who are, are bow hunting for garfish and leaving them on the, on the banks? I, I just think it is extraordinarily wasteful. Uh, yeah. um, I think that there's a lack of education. There's a lot of mistruths about GAR that are out there and that are perpetuated. And look, you, I can understand them, right? I mean, these are oftentimes big fish with big teeth that eat other fish. And it's easy to think that these fish are going to be wiping out all the smallmouth and the bass that you're hoping to catch. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I tell people is, you know, this is the equivalent to reintroducing wolves to sure. an ecosystem where wolves have always been. And what happens when you reintroduce wolves is all those sick deer that are spreading disease and making it really hard for you to get that eight point buck you've been after, um, they get eaten. And your buck gets to grow big and strong and you get to get that prize fish. When you have a healthy population of gar in waters where gar are supposed to be they play that regulatory role where they're going to take out the, the sip the small fish and they create upward pressure on bigger healthier sport fish yeah and plus they're so stinking cool looking i mean <laughs> they're those badass looking fish and they who, are. who wouldn't want to catch one they're great and they're fun as hell to catch man yeah i was fishing in uh in new orleans for redfish and we kept seeing garfish in the estuaries there, in the brackish water. And uh, the guide I was with would not let me catch one. He just absolutely, he hated them. Um, he didn't he want to kill them, but he didn't want them in his boat. Because they just, he said, they're so gross. Yeah, they mud the boat up and all this stuff. But then he gave me a recipe for, for garballs. Uh, because he actually was a fan of eating them. He goes, when he wants to eat a big fish, that's what he goes after. Well, and that's, you know, you think about all the garballs that are rotten on the banks or rivers throughout the midwest and yeah it's kind of it's, it's kind of sad you know it, it's, it's super sad uh in new hampshire uh, i'm sure out your way to uh carp hunting bow hunting for carp is a big deal um and it, it i always find it very frustrating to see people just killing a fish for the sake of it i have no problem with people eating the fish um but just killing them just because you're allowed to always gets under my skin a little bit i'm just like ah, just eat it like you want to bow hunt for them you know, or bury yeah. with your pumpkin seeds to give your kid a bigger, healthier pumpkin, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do something. Even that bothers me, though. I'm like, just eat it. Just eat it. They're all, it's all food. So that's really cool. Um, David, thank you so much for sharing these stories with me. Um, and you can find David at the Environmental Law and Policy Center. That's ELPC.org. And David, you're on Twitter a lot, right? I am. I'm at you? David ELPC. At David ELPC. Perfect. At David ELPC. If you want to ask David any questions, he's quick to respond on the, the old Twitter. So that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. 
We would like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. Special thanks to Rich Collins, Doc Martin, David Jakubiak, the guys over at Really Hooked Fish Company, Jeff Donaldson, and of course, Nick Hudson Squagger from the world-famous Diana's Bath Salts for mixing this show. So, until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds, spawn early and often, never trust a free lunch with strings attached, and swim against the current every chance you get. (laughs) 